Hi, I am Laura Chandler, host of the Sacred Stream radio podcast, and I'm here with my friend Julie Lewis, advocate, 39-year HIV survivor, and author of the new book, Still Positive, a Memoir. And I'm so happy to have Julie back to follow up on the conversation we had on episode 106 of the podcast, which I want to invite you to listen to on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, or anywhere you get your podcasts. And I'd especially like to invite you to read Julie's book, which she will hold up for us as well. And you can listen to it also because it's an audiobook too. It's a great read and it's a remarkable and inspiring story. So Julie, thanks for taking the time to be here. It's great to see you again. Well, happy to be back. <laughs> We had a great conversation the first time. I'm excited to see where this goes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'll just recap a little bit. Um, your book is the story of your life, living with HIV for almost 40 years now. You mm -hmm. contracted the disease in 1984, very early in the AIDS epidemic, through a blood transfusion that you received after, after giving birth to your first child. You went on to have two more children before finding out I think six years later, that you were HIV yeah. positive. <clears throat> and in the interview, we talk about how you navigated this with your family during a time when so little was known about AIDS and HIV, and there was so much fear and misunderstanding around it. And what we didn't have as much time to go into, which I'm looking forward to going into with you a little bit today, is the community that you helped to build and nurture and the role it played in supporting you and others. So I think it started when you joined the HIV Speakers Bureau. Yeah, it did. I mean, um, so in 1990, when I was diagnosed, just to recap, um, we didn't really tell very many people because my kids were so young. They were two, four, and six years old. So for the first four years I knew, we were, you know, you know very selective as to who we told. And it was a very small group of people, mostly just best friends and family, um, because I was afraid of the stigma for my kids. And, and we lived in a very conservative town and people had all kinds of opinions. And because they didn't know I had an HIV, people would share their opinions, you know? <laughs> and then it was like, oh, don't tell that person. You know, um, so everything didn't feel very safe. And then at some point um, when my kids were, Older, they were six, eight, and ten, which isn't a lot older, but it's a lot older than being two, right? Um, we ended up telling them, and because I'm an educator, um, I was high school teacher, and then worked um, in other ways in education. Uh, I just really wanted to join the group of people who were educating people about the disease um, to to try to lower that stigma and help people to ha who were infected to have you know, safer, um, lives basically. Uh, so that was, um, in 1994 and I was on that speakers bureau for almost 10 years and, um, ended up become, work, going to work for the health department, which is where the, um, the speakers bureau was managed and ended up being a co-manager of the speakers bureau in the end. Um, but over the years, uh, we usually had about 20 people on the speakers bureau and many, many of those people died in that time period. Um, so yeah, that was, um, it was a very different community than the community that, um, my family had been in. My husband's an ordained minister. He did youth ministry work. Um, so a lot of our uh, community of our family was uh, the evangelical church mm -hmm. uh, back in the 90s. So really different worlds <laughs> to, make, to make the biggest understatement of the day. Yeah. Um, yeah so um, I also have a, a gay brother who also had HIV at the time. So I was also interacting with all of his friends. Um, he lived in Seattle and I lived across the state. Um, but I had known a lot of his friends for a long time. So, um, yeah, it was like I had these buckets of community, right? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't really till the later 1990s when... Um, 
those worlds sort of, you know, after enough people knew, and I was doing so much public education in schools and colleges and, you know, doing the trainings for medical workers at the health department. Um, and then we ended up becoming um, legal guardians to uh a, a friend of mine who died's son and then you know eventually um all our worlds collided and and it was it was good i think um like any extended uh kind of family like <laughs> you know your community is kind of your extended family there's always uh challenges and um but i think everybody learned a lot uh, not just us and, and the people who really needed care, but also just the greater community of people. Um, I had a Bible study group of women who ended up being a huge support system to that Speakers Bureau. So, you know, it, it was a learning experience. It, it forced people to um, accept people who are very different than them and to learn to appreciate those differences and even celebrate them. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it was all big process. <laughs> But yeah, the Speakers Bureau became, the whole middle section of my book is about community and it's um, it's called Unlikely Partners because I don't know that I would have met a lot of my good friends any other way in my life um, yeah. than the Speakers Bureau and they became dear friends and, um, you know, a lot of what I did after um, in the last uh 10 to 20 years has been uh, to commemorate and to um, memorialize some of my friends I lost. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, and, and you're dealing with so much loss, you know, I mean, it's, yeah. it's an inev an inevitable in, in, in some ways. And how do you, and, and how do you manage that grief and that loss? And, and yeah, how, how do you do that? And how do others do that that you work with? Well, I think grief is and loss is one of those things that you really can't put a formula to. Um, you know, they have the, like the stages of grief and um, and a lot of that is real. Um, but I do think there's I can tell you, I got stuck in the denial phase for years and years and years. It just worked great for me. Um, you know, <laughs> there's anger, there's denial, there's um, you know, acceptance, there's the blaming. I mean, all of that is real, but people do those things so differently and so in their own time frame. Uh, and there's, but I, one thing I have learned is there's no way around it. Like if you don't actually go through the grief, it will come out sideways in some uh, probably not great way. <laughs> and um, yeah, so it's, it's, uh, it's not something that you get through or over, um, but you learn how to um, build your your new life of not you know of after loss around that loss, and and that can be really good. Like your you know your life can continue to be really good, but y you have to incorporate the loss into. You can't just. Ex act like it never happened yeah so. yeah yeah and you know you mentioned um it's a very poignant part of the book but you you uh, adopting your friend's child after your we, we did not adopt him we were his legal guardians because he was already when he came to live at our house he was a ninth grader yeah. and um and she had made a lot of and he had a lot of relatives mm -hmm. and she had made a lot of um hopes and dreams for him. Mm -hmm. And so he had a community mm -hmm. of people other than us. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there was at one point a talk of adopting, but um, that just didn't come to be. So, you know, and, yeah. But still the, the enormity of that, you know, taking that on. And um, can, can you talk a little bit more about that? Because that's, that's, it's a big deal. A big thing it was it was a lot and um well it it wasn't just an overnight thing um so so this family that we um were very close to they had uh so when i met joyce claypool the mom um and she was a very public figure so so i i can share her name um 
she, we, uh, it was that right before we kind of went public, I met her at a women's with, with, with AIDS group. And uh, we immediately bonded because she had two boys and a girl. So I have two girls and a boy, but they were literally the exact same age, almost to the day. And so our kids became friends. Um, so that started when my daughter was in fifth grade and her son that we ended up being legal guardians of was also in fifth grade. So from fifth grade on, um, we, we hung out with this family. Well, about a year and a half after we, we, we met them, their daughter. So her two sons were not infected, but her daughter, Kara, who was literally one week younger than Ryan, um, had been infected at birth and so and they were very public when she started school it was front page in our town um, she did a ton of educating um, but Kara ended up dying uh, two days before she started second grade mm -hmm. when she was seven yeah. so she was like that was a real change point for my kids because one of their friends actually died yeah. and they you know we had been going to the hospital all the time, taking our turn so that the family could take a break. Like, you know, we were very involved. So from fifth grade on, uh, I, because the mom was so sick, I had the two boys at my house a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and the kids all played together a lot. We did a lot of stuff together. And when Joyce started getting really, really sick, um, she had a plan for for um, Dale's brother, and she was she was really convinced that this was going to be good. But but she didn't feel like it was a good plan for Dale. So she asked me right before she died, and we we kind of knew this was coming because he he was practically living at our house anyway, right? That she would if we would be his legal guardians, and um, and we had already talked about it. So I said yes, and then. She died a couple of weeks later. She died two days before Christmas um, in 1998. And then it took, because we hadn't formalized it, it took, uh, he had to go into foster care. And it took, um, she died in December. It took until June to actually go to court and become legal guardians. Um, but again, he was at our house all the time. So, it, you know, it was, it was hard. I'm not going to lie for all of us, because we were all experiencing extreme grief mm -hmm. from losing not only Kara, but then Joyce. Mm -hmm. And this is, you know, he'd had three three people in his family die. And that's just a ton <laughs> of grief for anyone, right? And so, you know, I had four teenagers all at the same time. And that in itself is a lot. <laughs> but we also, I also had four teenagers who, who were dealing with adult things and yeah. on a big scale. Yeah. So I, I would say, you know, we had a lot of good times. We had a lot of hard times. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would say the looking back, my parental fail was that I did not get enough counseling for any of these kids. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't just demand that they go. Yeah. Because nobody wanted to go. Who wants to do that, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like you're already dealing with grief. I don't want to go talk about it, right? So I wasn't strong enough just to, like, bring in more professionals. You know, some else got and I thought our parenting skills would be, like, good enough for this whole situation. And I'm telling you, it was a lot. And, and a, a smarter, older woman, uh, me now, mm -hmm. would say to that person who was 40, like, no. Like your whole family just needs some serious counseling, right. <laughs> you know. And we didn't do that hard work until later, mm -hmm. um, after Dale left, and uh, you know, pretty much wanted his independence, which you know he was at that age. Kids want independence, and um, yeah, you know, with with extreme loss for that, like that for kids. Mm -hmm. um, they have to revisit that loss at every point in their life. Like, you know, from, you know, when they become young adults to when they have their own kids and then they think back like of their, their childhood and losing their sister. 
or when they're, you know, just every point in your life, if you have a major trauma, mm-hmm. you have to reassess that if you were a child when that happened. Yeah. And even adults, but especially children, because they develop, you know, mm-hmm. and then they learn and then they look, oh, what do I think about that now? Mm-hmm. So it's complicated and it's really good to have any kind of uh, professional system behind you, helping you understand how to um, navigate yeah. that. Yeah. So. Well, and I'm, I'm sure that your, you, you and your husband's parenting skills were, were very helpful. Taxed. <laughs> Tax to the max. Yeah. You know, we were, even our marriage, you know, when you're in the middle of trauma, you are trying to keep your head over, you know, above water. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of things you let slip by yeah. um, just to survive. And then they, they don't go away, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And I talk about that in the third section of the book, mm-hmm. how around about our 25th wedding anniversary, we were finally didn't have very many problems. And so all of a sudden we could see all this dysfunction that we really hadn't dealt with mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and we went to counseling and, you know, we've been married 41 years now, but that was like, you, you think things are just going to blow over. <laughs> they right. don't. You know, life has a way of like resurfacing. Yeah. Well, sometimes it's a, it's a, what you can handle and figure, you know, you have the, the urgent things happening first that you're just dealing yeah. with in the moment, you know, the tom- trauma, the yeah. post-trauma. So it, it's really understandable. And also, you know, I mean, like in a perfect world, you know, all of those things would have been obvious and known, but that's not the way it works, you know? And no, so- I deal with that as a healthcare provider on a different, you know, in a different arena, mm-hmm. you know, even with, HIV prevention. It's like, you just have to take this medicine and you won't even be able to infect other people anymore, but you have to take it. Mm -hmm. Well, if HIV is not in your top 10 problems, if you're looking for shelter and food and, you know, trying to manage a abusive spouse, I mean, like Mm -hmm. taking that medicine seems easy to me, but you know, if you're already overwhelmed, remembering one more thing every day and trying to get it. And yeah. so like, yeah, that's just true. You, we always, you know, have this way of judging other people from our vantage point, but our vantage point is sometimes way different than what their reality is for another person. So yes. I try to remember that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, you know, and again, I think part of the, the, the book is, you know, I, I've said said it more than once, it's inspiring because it's, in a way, it's universal. It speaks to mm-hmm. so many aspects of the human experience and the human condition. And anyone will re, who reading this book um, can relate to it. They can relate to it from the perspective of, of you being a mom. And, and it is a mom story. I mean, literally, um... I, I was laughing with my husband this morning. I said, oh, because I've, I've done quite a lot of podcasts. <laughs> and I said, you know, I try to figure out how podcasts actually equal book sales. Yeah. And um, and it's hard to, like, really see, like, because you kind of look at Amazon or whatever. But I said, but one thing's for sure. I don't sell as many books when I'm on a podcast with a man than I do when I'm on a podcast with a woman. <laughs> And I think this is just because this is like a mom story, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, whether you're in the middle of mothering or mm-hmm. even grandparenting or or like just the phase of life that I'm in as a woman, you relate way more to the book, mm-hmm. I think, that, than guys, you know. Unless, you know, yeah. I mean, that's I mean, a little bit sexist to say, but it, it, I'm just noticing that in my book sales, you know, because it is a mom story. It is. Yeah. And it's more than a mom story too. So I, so I do, well, I do it. encourage, Way more. Yeah, I, do encourage <laughs> I do encourage the fellas out there to, um, Oh no, I've had lots of guys who really love the book, but yeah. I'm just saying as audiences go, I, I, and I, and yeah, I hear you. Yeah. I hear you. <laughs> and it's also, it's also, you know, the, you know, I think the context, the context or the, you know, the, the type of podcast it is or something, you know, I think that definitely on our podcast, we have a lot of people who are very, would be very interested in, in this story and who are doing a lot of self-reflection, who do a lot of, you know, 
uh, spiritual self-reflection as well as emotional self-reflection. And so, you know, it, it, that's definitely, um, speaks to those people. The book would speak. Yeah. Well, I have a lot of spiritual thoughts in that book. Mm -hmm. Um, obviously we were really tied into more of a traditional church, but, um, I think I tried really hard to speak to sort of the universal church and, and just even the thought that maybe there's something bigger than and un you know, more unseen in the world happening than, um, than my logical science teacher brain wants to like, always like think about. Right. So, and I think that a lot of that is what got me through. It, you know, the connection to God or to um, the church in general and just the church is on its worst, you know, I used to teach at a Catholic school and it's like, I just have a wide array of um, kind of different faith experiences. And I feel like none of them are perfect. <laughs> I mean, I'm just going to say it. But I think that I've grown from the, the diversity of just looking at how other people um, relate to um, God or a bigger spiritual experience. Um, I've learned a lot from a lot of different things. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's important and, you know, I, and it's, and it, and it's also helpful. And I, I believe that, you know, faith, and how we relate to spirit and spirituality, God, however you relate, however you describe it, is personal. It's yeah, it is personal. And I did talk to sort of a traditional, like, what didn't help? Yeah. <laughs> what didn't help was people trying to fix me immediately because they couldn't actually emotionally handle uh, a really sad situation. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that happens in a lot of different realms um, in life, not just AIDS. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just how I really appreciated people who could just sit with me mm -hmm. in the sadness uh, and just acknowledge that it was sad, you know, <laughs> yeah. at the time. And, and what would you There's very few people who can do that well. Um, I, I admire them because I'm not even sure I'm able to do that well, but it's a real gift to just be able to, to sit with someone in their, um, their depression or their sadness or um, they're just unfixable situation. You know, like there's, we live in a world where like, look at every day, it's just hard to know how to even um, begin to resolve uh, the evil and the, um, just the daily um, bombardment of the news. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't know. I'm just overwhelmed, but I'm also like really believe that collectively people can have a voice and make a difference and um, stand up, like just to say, oh, well, there's nothing we can do. I just don't believe that. Right. Um, I've never believed that. So, well, you know, two things come to mind there. One, uh, I want, cause I want to follow up on what you were just saying. Um, but before I do, I want to just ask, um, you know, what, what would you say helped you with your faith? What, what was the most helpful aspect of it or how did it help you? Well, wow. That's a good question. Um, I think for me, I have had a deep faith for since I was a small child, and I didn't grow up in a religious family, but I always had this um, feeling like there was a greater God that was just kind of with me. And um, so... So as a young uh, adult, um, I got involved in some church stuff and, and, but, but the community side of church, um, I always struggled with, um, I'm a, well, I'm a super introverted person. So I like to just, I, I journal a lot. I pray a lot, and, but I've always done this even 
randomly, right? So, um, so two things after I got this diagnosis that I was supposed to live for three to five years is um, I think I spent even more time just going, okay, God, if this is going to happen, like, I don't, I, I'm just going to trust you. Like there was a trust and I feel like, and a hope. So I think those two things I had developed over my whole entire life, just this ability to trust and to hope. And then being a science teacher, I also am very factual. So I'm like, okay, um, this doesn't look good. I'm not going to pretend like this isn't going to happen, but I'm just going to trust that whatever I need, I'm going to get whatever I, um, you know, that I'll be prepared because, you know, God will provide. I'm, I'm going to hope beyond hope that maybe I'll get more time, you know, like, and then at some point I'm like, I just got to stop thinking about it all the time. <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm going to live my life the best I can with the time I have. And the last thing I want is for my kids to to have a sad mother, you know, like they don't want to remember a sad mother, right? So I'm just going to be as optimistic and positive and just trust. So there was that. I think the other thing that uh, that happened was I found a group of faithful women who beyond my expectations started um, taking care of me, being a substitute mothers for me, mm. took my kids, all the time, provided food, like, and I'm not very good at accepting help. Like I like to be very independent, but I would not have made it through those very six years, six years without this group of women. So they were kind of like my faith women. They were like the best of the church ladies that you would never <laughs> meet on the planet, right? Yeah. <laughs> and and so as many of them are still very good friends of mine. Uh, and a lot of them were like 10 to 15 years older than me. So they didn't have little kids. They had like teenagers or young adult kids. Mm -hmm. So they were really available and they had a lot of wisdom. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, those two things I would say mm -hmm. as far as, just the spiritual part of my life were were equally important not just my individual like meditation journaling prayer time mm -hmm. but also this this amazing community yeah and i'd never really had to benefit or depend on a community so both of those things were big yeah yeah and we're, we're back to the community um concept again mm -hmm. and you know i i you know, when I invited you back and we, we were speaking a little bit about what we wanted to talk about today, um, I said, you know, we're we're in this so diff such a difficult time and the world is at war. It's been at war for a long time and it's just it's, it's even more intense and even more wars are breaking out. And I, I think just globally, politically, um, people are are struggling and. And, you know, this idea of, of community is so important and your, your struggle, you know, is, is like a, a map in some ways where people can draw from your experiences and your insights. And I'm just wondering if you have anything you'd like to share for folks who are struggling. And, you know, the thing I should add, too, is COVID. COVID really created this sense of isolation for everybody yeah. and separate. Well, it wasn't a sense. It was a real thing. And, and uh, especially, if especially if you were in a vulnerable com uh, community like I, like I am. Exactly. Um, I mean, this book, um, my co-author, Jenny Koenig, who's 39. So she's like my daughter's. She is my daughter's mm -hmm. age. That's how I met her um, 20 years ago. We were both extremely isolating uh during covid um my brother-in-law died of covid um and you know i mean this is a story of privilege completely i wasn't a grocery store worker who had to go to work but so i spent a lot of time isolating um at my son's uh house in eastern washington and jenny um 
what was uh, pregnant with her first child and a little bit of a high risk pregnancy. So she was also not supposed to go anywhere, do anything. So we had decided to work on this book, but for us, this was our little oasis of community on, you know, we were mostly always online together, but you know, it was really a blessing uh, for both of us to just have someone that you're going to meet with every day to work on a project because it was very lonely um, to not be able to have my regular life. Right. And um, so anyway, yeah, I don't today. There are just so many things and um, and some of them I think we just really actually need to stand up for and actually do the hard like political work um, and I've done that there's a bit of that in my book for other issues and other times but um, just because a lot of us live in a comfortable world here in parts of the U.S. it's um, we have we have to stand up for our our you know, human brothers and sisters and, and do what's right. Um, so there's that, but on a personal level, I think building a community, even if it's just a few people who you can trust and, and be with and be committed to that community. Um, and, you know, find, find not only people who you can give out to, but people who uh, feed your soul, you know? And, and I think um, I love, one of the things I did, this is random. One of the things I did that I talked about it then in a book is um, I did a lot of uh, walking during that time and listening to audiobooks. Um, and one of the books I listened to during COVID was the diary of Anne Frank. It had just been Re rewritten a little bit. They added a few of the risque parts that they thought shouldn't be in it when, you know, I was a small child reading that book. But, um, and then it was, I listened to the audiobook read by Selma Blair, and I just highly recommend it. Um, but it was such a great um, thing to listen to during COVID because uh, it's not like I was living in an attic room, you know, hiding from the Nazis, but it was a very isolated community and she was a kid and she, so she did a great job at getting the most out of the simple things in life and celebrating every little thing they could celebrate while not denying the fact that they were living in hell, um, waiting to possibly get caught. And it was just this really, um, that she was this young girl, right? It, it's such an amazing book, like in general. And in the middle of it, she said, I wish I could write something truly great. Well, she's writing like one of the biggest classics ever, right? Mm -hmm. But sometimes our stories are the classic, you know, they are the story. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, I... I got so much out of that book because it was this dichotomy of like the simplest things bringing, bringing pleasure to people and being able to celebrate those while this horror was happening around the world. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we're kind of there right yeah. now, you know? So, um, so I try to celebrate the, the little things, you know, like writing a note to someone and actually mailing it in the old fashioned mail yeah. is sometimes like, so significant to that person um, or just the little things. And then also like trying to do something about the big problems too. Yeah. So, yeah, that's cool. I don't even know if we have strength for the big problems, if we're not like finding some joy in the moments. Right. Yeah. That's a great so, point. That's a great point. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, and you're, you're, you're mentioning the call to action and I, um, we talked quite a bit about this in the a previous interview. And so I'm going to invite people to listen to that interview, to read your book. And when we go over, but I do want to mention uh, the 3030 project, which is your set was your celebration of yeah. 30 surviving 30 years and your son, Ryan Lewis, the uh, Grammy winning uh, musician and, and uh, producer encourage that along with the, the rest of your family. And you, that's the third part of your book. And you achieved- It is the third 
Or so much. Yeah. It's it's so much. Uh, so maybe just say a little bit to give people a, a a, a taste of that so they'll go go listen and read more it's okay. so remarkable well i'll start out by saying the 3030 project has its own website if i don't do a very good job of this it's just 3030project.org yeah. um so when uh i was reaching my 30th year of surviving hiv my kids wanted to celebrate that and because so many of our friends had died celebrate it seemed weird a weird word to you know to, to do so I said, let's find a project we can do to commemorate our friends who had died. And at the time, I was working for a nonprofit construction company called Construction for Change. So my big idea was to like have our family raise enough money to build a, a healthcare facility somewhere in the world um, that lacked healthcare access for, for an organization that needed it. And I picked Partners in Health out of Boston uh, because they do such significant work. Um, and I picked a project in Malawi, but then Ryan, you know, in the in his all his twenty five year oldness, he would laugh right now because it's been ten years, right? Now he has a couple of kids, but uh, he's so optimistic, and he's like, "We need to build thirty of those." And I just looked at him like, "That is so much more than one." But he got into it, and, and you know, Macklemore and Ryan Lewis were definitely in those early years. Um, very supportive of helping us raise money. And it took us five years, but we raised the funds to build the 30 healthcare facilities. And um, and our last building is under construction right now. So it'll end up being, uh, it started in 2014 and we'll, we'll completely end it in um, next year, 2024. So um, yeah, and it, it was a ton of work. <laughs> You told me when I said, yes, this is going to be a 10 year project of you working constantly and raising money. And, um, you know, I don't know, if, you know, I still have HIV. It's, it's a lot. So uh, I don't know if I would have like said, sure, I'll do that. But you know how you you boil a frog, you put it in cold water and turn up the heat slowly. I feel like that is how this project went. It was like, you know, you get in deep enough, you're like, okay, I can do this. Okay, I better finish this, you know. So anyway, but Construction for Change managed that project. We didn't start our own organization. They did a lot of our buildings and they continued to build um, social infrastructure um, in communities around the world that need it. So yeah, so that, that was a, it was a significant work. And um, there were many nights in those early years of trying to do this project that I would wake up and think, oh my gosh, I'm going to totally fail on this. Um, but again, we raised a community uh, of mostly women who were just like boots on the ground raising money with me. So uh, it wasn't like I did it myself. Construction for Change was amazing. Um, as a partner, uh, yeah, it took a village to do that. Yeah. But, but you know, it's scary when you have an idea or you accept that you're going to try an idea because mm -hmm. it was just an idea at the beginning that's so far beyond anything you know you can actually pull off. Yeah. Um, it was a huge risk, and I'm not a huge risk taker. <laughs> I, like things, I like things I know I'm going to succeed at, right? So it was a good learning lesson for me. Um, that, you know, you're never too old to just take a risk and do something. I mean, what was the worst that could happen? We would have only built 15 healthcare facilities. I mean, would that be a failure, right? <laughs> but right. that's better than one, right? Yeah. So I always encourage people, I do a lot of public speaking, and I always encourage people, like, just go for your big idea. Why not? Like, what's the worst thing that can happen? Probably not, not as bad as you think. <laughs> or something really <laughs> amazing. Exactly you can change the world right, That's right. so so yeah. so helpful and and again i use that term so inspiring and um people can learn more hear your remarkable story on audio or reading the book still positive a memoir with julie lewis yeah. and we have links below here to um your websites including construction for change. And thank you so much for coming back and taking some time to, to delve a little bit more deeply thank you. into. Thank you. And I, I guess if I would add something, mm -hmm. if like if I want a personal plug, mm -hmm. um, since the 
30 30 as you know pretty much sunsetted mm -hmm. and um and the book is out there but it's kind of got it's it's on its own train mm -hmm. doing its thing i am open a lot more than i was in the last few years to um speaking engagements um i've been a speaker for 30 years yeah. and so uh yeah if anybody needs a keynote speaker i um i my i've been saying this a lot so my calendar's starting to fill up but um i i do so love a stage <laughs> i'm an introvert until i get on a stage and i do love uh i love speaking and i love um telling other people's not just my story but i've met a lot of women around the world and they have some great stories that's so i'm basically a storyteller yeah, yeah. that's great and people can reach you at the still positive um, website Yes, either stillpositive.com. Uh, they can instant message me on our uh, Instagram, uh, Still Positive Book, mm -hmm. or they can actually get hold of me on the 3030 Project website too. So I have websites. Yeah. Great. <laughs> <laughs> too many, actually. <laughs> that's perfect. No, that's great. It's so, so lovely again to spend some time and to talk more about your book and just really wishing you well with the book and with all everything that you do. Well, thanks so much, Laura. Thanks for having me on again. This is a fun place. Well, maybe we should touch base again in six months. Yeah. Let, 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 let me, <laughs> we'll be more to talk. We'll make a habit of it. Yeah, I would love it.